Welcome to the Those Who Came Before Us podcast. I'm your host, David Ivanda. Before we begin today, I would like to say thank you to everyone who took the time to listen to the podcast. It means a lot to me that you all get value from the stories that I tell. I hope that continues to be the case because there's a lot that I want to share. So wherever you are around the world, thank you. Now, in the last episode, we took a break from Bunyoro and talked about police in Africa. This week, we go back to Bunyoro and discuss the beginnings of their third dynasty, the Babito. The Matrezi leaders had been overthrown, and the Babito were now the royal clan. But I'm also going to talk about their state of decline from number one regional power to playing second fiddle to the small but aggressive kingdom of Buganda in the 19th century. This is where they became part of the long-distance trade with Arabs on the coast and Khartoum in Sudan, and when they encounter European travelers which led to their eventual colonization. In 16th century Bunyoro, a young man by the name of Rukidi was to be crowned as king of Bunyoro. According to tradition, Rukidi had been sent for as a replacement by his father in Mutrezi, Chomia, before their disappearance. And Mutrezi, by the way, means a person belonging to the Mutrezi group, like a Spaniard is from Spain. Before the coronation, his head was shaved, his fingernails trimmed, and was smeared with a type of butter. He was adorned with two pieces of flowing bark cloth, covered with beads, bracelets, and a crown made from the hairs of the colobus monkey. The fur was stitched onto the crown to make it look like a lion's mane. It's said that the ancient fireplace of their predecessors of Atrezi was covered up with earth and fashioned into a mound. And on top of it, every king that followed was to stand on it during their coronation. Rukidi stood on the mound and was subjected to a number of rituals and required to repeat the following oath. Open quotes. This is the kingdom of my forefathers, of many generations. Thou Rohanga Ncha Kancha, begat the rulers of mankind. Thou art God of heaven, hell, and earth. If I, Mpuga, lie and this is not the kingdom of my ancestors, let me die now in the sight of all men. Close quotes. This oath was required in order to reinforce the legitimacy of the ruler. They were heirs of the Batrezi all the way back to Kakama. But if you remember from the previous episodes, you realize that this is most likely not the case. Rukidi, like others before him, is an amalgamation of several others with the same name. When your historian Yolamu Samba tells us of two individuals with the same name, one ruled before the establishment of the Babito dynasty that the name Rukidi is associated with. Now, you might wonder why they chose to pick the same name, and there's a few reasons for this. One is that these names are previously titles that were passed down to rulers in a clan, but eventually these titles overshadowed their actual names and this is how they were remembered. The other reason, I think, is because of the lack of a writing system. With that one, the Banyoro could only remember so much or had to find other ways to do so. You can see how over time it becomes difficult to differentiate between which Rikidi did what or where. The establishment of the Babito marked a turning point in the kingship of the nation. For the first time ever, the king was not allowed to hold any ritual power. The previous rulers, like the Batrezi and the Batembuzi, had been both healers and politicians. For the Babito, the ritual role was taken up mainly by the Basuli clan, whom they had promised that position. Other ritual leaders were able to keep their power amid this transition, David Schoenbrunn wrote that some of them accepted the dominion of Rukiri, while others refused, and the rest accepted, but only under the condition that they maintained a certain amount of sovereignty. And this was the case with a lot of the clans. Some were able to negotiate the power dynamics in this new era of Babito rule. The most notable example of this would be that of Omara. Now, if you remember, he was the previous ruler during the Batrezi dynasty, but after his overthrow and demise, the Babito made Wamara spirit the protector of the state. This was their way of appeasing the Bamuli clan, which was the clan that Wamara belonged to. 
It wasn't a perfect compromise, though, because Nsamba tells us that the Mamuli clan never really accepted Babito rule. The most obvious indication of this is that the Babito were unable to capture the royal drum of the Mamuli clan called Rusama. Drums were significant items in the regalia of clans in the Great Lakes region. They were used to assemble people, to mark the significance of an event, even to show victory among other things. So hiding their royal drum from the Babito was an attempt to maintain a certain amount of power after having been toppled from the apex of society. The Bamuli clan headed by Wamara was the last stronghold of the Batrezi rule. Now, they were to serve someone else. After Wamara was made the guardian of the state and that of the Babito, imagine that, his medium, also called Wamara because he would be possessed by him, became the custodian for the royal battle spear called Chimulicho Chamahanga, the spear that conquers the world. It was this really long brass spear. Wamara would bless kings before going into war, then hand them that spear. He was still very much revered. Wamara's shrines were able to offer protection to those fleeing the anger of the king, so it was beneficial for Benora kings to be on good terms with Wamara. Do you want to know what happens when that's not the case? Let me tell you a brief story. An 18th century Bunyoro king by the name of Limi Sansa III decided to attack Nkore. Nkore is a country south of Bunyoro. For reference, check out the map on the podcast Instagram page called TWCBU Pod. Again, that is TWCBU Pod. Anyways, this was a plan that Wamara's medium greatly opposed. Isasa went ahead with his plan, and as Wamara had said, he lost. His troops got sick, they ended up starving, and his son ended up being captured. He blamed Wamara's medium for this, and in his anger, attacked his shrine and killed many of whom tradition calls his children, but were really his followers. In turn, Wamara's medium cursed Isansa and turned the royal spear upside down to seal it. He said, open quotes, Your kingdom will be swallowed up by the shield of your young brother, the king of Buganda. Close quotes. The king's actions had violated the sanctity of the shrines and the office of Wamara. It said that the trees wept and bled because of the sacrilege. This led to a revolt by the Bamuli clan and allowed Buganda to encroach on Bunyoro territory, just as Wamara had said. As demonstrated, Wamara's medium was not to be messed with. Now, let's take a look at the identity of the Babito. Oro tradition says that they were Luo people who were invited to rule. The Luos are a Nilotic ethnic group that are found throughout East Africa. Some are in Uganda, Kenya southwestern Ethiopia, Sudan. Within the Luo group are several tribes like the Acholi, the Lango, the Alur, etc. So these are the people who are said to have been invited by the Batrezi to replace them. Now, of course, that sounds too good to be true. Way too easy. So historians suggested that it must have been an invasion, and that this group must have been so small that they got assimilated into Bunyoro culture instead of the other way around. Nsamba negates this, though, and tells us that it wasn't an invasion, but rather a rebellion united under the Babito, as we discussed in episode 4. The Babito clans had been in Bunyoro for centuries by the time of the rebellions. He also argues that their origins can be traced to the Babito clans that lived among the Anwaks and the Nuars of Ethiopia and Sudan. Things seemed to work out for the Babito, in the sense that the weather got better. The drought that contributed to the decline of the Batrezi alleviated, and for the first time in a long while, food was in abundance. The population increased and people slept well. They were happy. This allowed for even more separation of ritual and secular power. The people weren't looking to the kings for answers to their problems, and thus were able to focus more on actual governing. This made the early Babito kings very popular. It's even said that the third Babito king, Oyoniba, was so well-liked that he was given the name Kabambai Guru, which means that he had enough children to populate the sky. John Nakatura recorded that King Oyo had 200 kids. Ruth Fisher, on the other hand, wrote that he had 4,000 children. Nzamba assures us that these numbers are greatly exaggerated. The rumor was spread by his subjects in order to give him a good reputation. 
more children was seen as a sign of prosperity. Bunyoro was a very proto-natalist society. Oyonimba is very well remembered for his generosity and goodness. And he also did something in his old age that stood out in the collective minds of Bunyoro. And that is that he made a pledge to never make war. People wanted to be free. They didn't want to fight. That being said, the Papito have a dark reputation, one that is mired in infighting and rebellion. This is explained by the Banyoro through a story about Rukidi, the first Mubito king, when he was coming to Banyoro to rule. It's said that when Rukidi and his entourage came upon the Victoria Nile, their diviners told them that in order for them to have a prosperous rule, they needed to offer a sacrifice of a baby, beads, a cow, and money to the spirit of the river. Everything was easy to sacrifice except, obviously, the baby. If they were to toss a baby in, whose baby were they going to pick? It just so happened that the child of Rukidi's brother Nyarwa, who had just started to walk, picked up one of the beads and swallowed it. The diviners then said that the river had picked its victims, and that if they didn't offer that child, bad luck would befall every single one of them. By majority decision, the baby was cut open, the bead retrieved, and both tossed into the river. Now you can only imagine how Nyarwa felt. He was distraught and angry with his brother. How could he? Rukidi, using some twisted logic, grabbed another woman's child and threw that child into the river. This was supposed to appease his brother, or in some sense, balance the scales. Except now he had two people angry at him. The mother of the child cursed all of them, saying, Just like you murdered your own and my child, so too will you murder yourselves. It's said that the then-future rulers of Nero fell silent, struck by the powerful words of a distraught mother. And judging by the history of the Babito, the curse seems to have come true. This story, though, is mere legend, used to explain the Babito situation. Unsurprisingly, there is another story that is similar to this one, but it involves different characters, and those would be Nipir and Labon. Now, after King Oyoniba, the next rulers were more aggressive and went back to the conqueror mentality. Kings such as Nyabongo ruled from western Uganda to as far as Naivasha in western Kenya. John Beatty the ethnographer even mentions that the Babito kings fought wars with the Azande. The Azande are a group of people who live in northeastern Congo and South Sudan. They're the ones with the really cool weapons, if, you've, if you know about them. Does anybody remember that show called Deadliest Warrior on Spike? If you do or don't, the Azande were featured in Season 2, Episode 5. It might be interesting to check out if you want to get a small idea of who I'm talking about. Now, Asamba tells us that the Empire would expand and contract depending on who was king. For the most part, these territories were sovereign in their own right. Some are said to have developed as a result of the breakup of the Chitara Empire at the fall of the Batrezi. Examples being the kingdoms of Buganda and Nkore. The Babito kings inherited what was left of it, and would gain and lose territory depending on their king and which wars they won or lost. And then you had others like Winnie II, whose praise name, Rubagira Masega, meant he who feeds humans to vultures, would lose territory. This king had a morbid fascination with vultures. They say that whenever he heard them cry, he'd say, Poor creatures! They're asking me for food. He would then order the murder of some of his people and then have them fed to his vultures. Winnie II was a straight-up villain. His own people hated him so much that they simply abdicated to the power of their neighbors, the Baganda. It's said that King Katerika of Buganda just strolled in and took control of some areas without a fight. Because who the hell wants to fight for a king who treats his subjects as food for his pets? Winnie's cruelty was so shocking that his own son, Prince Chibikaganda, rebelled and received the full backing of multiple clans. He sounded the war drum called Kachwankizi, which means, I kid you not, breaker of spinal cords. This name tells you all you need to know about how the people felt about him. Only a drum with such a name would be capable of expressing the retribution that his people wanted to exact on him. 
I wonder what a drum with such an ominous name must have sounded like. Did it produce specific sounds like the Aztec death whistle? Hmm. Winnie the Second's fate isn't revealed to us, but I assume it ended with a broken back. By the 18th century, Venora began to lose its regional dominance. It was slowly being overtaken by the neighboring kingdom of Buganda. Historians describe Bunyora in the late 18th to 19th century as a state in decline, a state that was being overshadowed by the neighboring kingdom of Buganda. The main issue highlighted was the weak administrative structure of the kingdom. The loosely organized nature of it is said to have been a cause of the rebellion of multiple princes, but Bunyora's decline started even before that. Historians Shane Doyle and Yolamun Samba mentioned that it was the clan resistance to the Bunyoro government that started it. Remember that Bunyoro was made up of clans? Clans that had their own agendas and needs, and if they weren't met, or if they were persecuted, this would be cause for resistance. I've already given you an example of that with the story of Wamara and Olimi Sansa III. His dismissal of Omar's advice and his subsequent attack on his personhood resulted in the rebellion of the Bamuli clan. Then you have the Basagi clan, who have a long track record of resistance against any monarch. This was due to a number of atrocities that they suffered at the hands of the Babito, in particular those of Winnie the Second, the guy that I mentioned before who fed his people to vultures. But also the hands of Olimi Sansa the Third. This in turn caused them to resist in various ways, from assassination attempts to helping political fugitives escape the wrath of the crown. Even though what was done to them might have happened generations ago, they never forgot the injustices suffered by their clan. And on top of this was the overambition of the 18th century kings. Olimi Sansa III doomed himself on a pointless mission to retake Nkore. And guess who was standing in his way on the road to Nkore? members of the Basaigi clan. They wanted vengeance against him for his persecution of their people during his father's time. His son and successor, Ruhaga I, who ruled from 1731 to 1782, was also overly eager, which in his case I can kind of understand given that his father's actions had chipped away at the territory of the kingdom. But Ruhaga also had an iron will and a fiery temper. He was given the praise name Matamanquera, which means spitting cobra, because his cheeks would shake whenever he was enraged. And this anger would cause him to do things like walk back on the pledge to never make war, and also be reckless by going to war with Buganda. In this story, Ruhaga had two diviners giving him opposing pieces of advice. One told him that he should go ahead with this war. The other told him that he shouldn't. But because he wanted to go to war, Ruhaga went with the one who agreed with him. Upon hearing his decision, the diviner who opposed him apparently threw his spear to the ground and jumped up and down and swore, If you win, may I and my children never be your diviners. And well, Ruhaga was categorically and decisively beaten by the Baganda. Many royals lost their lives in that battle. It was said that 70, 70 of his sons died in that war. And to rub salt in his wounds, Ruhaga had to flee from the battlefield with the Baganda in hot pursuit. He ended up being injured in the process. And you know what happens to Bunyoro kings when they get injured. They are required to kill themselves using a mixture of poison and honey. This is a classic example of the Bunyoro kings biting off more than they could chew and subsequently losing power because of it. Now, Ruhaga still had a few sons left, at least two that we know of. One of them was called Kasoma and was at his father's side while he killed himself, and it's said that while he was about to do this, Kasoma wept bitterly only for his father to turn to him and admonish him for being weak. 
Ruhanga was prepared to face the consequences of his actions. And in his final moments, he told his son Kasoma that he must succeed him. But first, he had to beat his older brother. It was Winyoro custom that two brothers would fight for the right to rule in a battle of succession. Well, if you intended on challenging the favorite for the throne, that is. Kasoma won the fight, but within just four years, he was deposed by his brother Yamatogura, and it all happened because Kasoma was unable to mediate properly a disagreement between two of his chiefs. One of them went and back to Yamatogura, and this won him the throne. After his win, Yamatogura had Kasoma brought to him and offered him not just mercy, but also his pick of any post that he would want. But unfortunately, Kasoma was no longer the weeping child that he once was. He was now a badman like his father and said the following, open quotes, I do not want any of these posts. I have been king. And do you seriously think that I'm going to crawl and worship you? If it was I who had vanquished and captured you, you could not be making use of those eyes of yours. I would have smashed that stomach of yours. Do not ask such a ridiculous question. Take the throne which you have seized from me and do your worst. <sighs> At that point, he had to be executed. What was he supposed to do? Spare his brother who had just insulted him after he offered him mercy? In front of others? That would have made him look weak. Kasama was executed near a lake. And interestingly, Yamatukura had those he ordered to kill his brother executed right after. It was probably a way of him dealing with the frustration of being forced to kill his own brother. Remember the curse, people. Remember the curse of the distraught mother. This is an example of it happening. Yamatukura ruled from 1786 to 1835. This period is very significant, because this is where the bulk of the princely rebellions began. The reason for this was that King Yamatukura had ruled for a long time. Some even secretly hoped he would be overthrown. It was said he was so old he couldn't even walk on his own. His sons wanted a shot at the throne. <laughs> I rhymed. I've been listening to George the Poet a lot lately, so I, I've kind of got the uh, a little bit of the rhyming bug. What can I say? He's a fellow Ugandan. If any of you haven't heard of him, check out his podcast called Have You Heard George's Podcast? Again, that's Have You Heard George's Podcast? You thank me later. In any case, Yamatukura's sons felt that the clock was running out for them. One of them, by the name of Karasuma, went to the king of Buganda and asked him for a small army. This army was to be used to overthrow his father. Now, this sort of thing happened quite a bit. Bunyoro and Buganda liked to meddle in each other's politics, kind of like Russia and the U.S. However, this time, King Kamanyo Buganda was on good terms with Nyamutukura. So he refused, and on top of that, sent a message to Nyamutukura and told him of his son's plot. He also advised him that, well, his sons kind of did have a point. He was an old man, and they were getting old too. Perhaps he should step down and give his sons a chance to rule. Yamatukura responded to Kamanya's unsolicited advice by telling him to just go ahead and kill his son. He also said, did he not deserve a roof over his head? Was he to be stripped of everything he owned while he was alive? Translation, what he really means by this is that the kingdom belonged to him. As long as he was alive, there would be no stepping down of any sort. The king of Buganda apparently did not like this response and refused to do that. He instead sent the prince Karasuma on his way home with protection. Unfortunately, the prince never made it home. His father assassinated him on the way. The other son, Kaboyo, also decided to rebel. But this time, things were different. Despite multiple warnings about the intentions of his son, Yamatukura couldn't bring himself to do anything about it. Why was that? This was because Kaboyo was his favorite son. And because of this, Kaboyo was able to take the polity of Toro in 1830. His actions also emboldened others such as the Paluo princes in the northern provinces of Bunyoro. They too rebelled and Bunyoro 
subsequently lost free access to northern Uganda. But you know what? There's also another reason why Nyamchukura couldn't do anything about his son's rebellions. Remember how I talked about the pledge to never make war? The one that uh, King Oyonima made? Well, Nyamchukura made that pledge. And while promising to never fight is a noble act, and was made during times of extended peace, this vow has one glaring defect, which is that it doesn't include your enemies. You might as well announce on speaker that your enemies can attack you, and you won't do a damn thing about it. You're a lion, with no fangs. In order to fix this, acts of war were left in the hands of important chiefs. But this required the utmost of loyalty. Because as history shows, the other Babito took the chance to rip off chunks of land and declare their independence. Historian Gian Uzoigwe tells us of a Babito proverb that encapsulates their feelings towards loss of territory. It goes like this. Open quotes. When a louse crawls from the head to the beard, has it strayed? I'll say that again. When the louse crawls, from the head to the beard, has it strayed. Close quotes. The idea here is that it did not matter where these runaway princes ruled. They were still part of Bunyoro, whether they said so or didn't. Bunyoro was the body and the princes were the lice walking all over it. <laughs> Ooh, I just shivered saying that. It's the same concept of, if I cut off my arm, is it still my arm? The answer is yes. Yes, it is. The fact is, Bunyoro was woefully unprepared for what was about to happen next. By the 1840s, the Great Lakes kingdoms were trading heavily with the Arabs on the coast. Ivory was a hot commodity, and with it, Bunyoro was able to purchase silk, cloth, and guns, among other things. You know what else was a hot commodity? If you guess slaves, you are right. The East African slave trade had been going on for many centuries by that point, and during this time, the coastal Arabs and the Arabs from Sudan had penetrated the interior in search of more ivory and slaves. Unfortunately, Bunyoro was also involved in the business of trading slaves. They would raid their neighbors and sell them to the slave traders who were based in Khartoum, Sudan. They too, however, were also raided for slaves by their neighbors, in particular Buganda. It's important to note that part of Buganda's rise to the number one spot during this time was their access to trade. Buganda, through King Mutesa, forbade the Arab traders from trading with Bunyoro. This was his condition for allowing them to come back to his court after his father had kicked them out in the 1840s due to a strange relationship. Until then, the Arabs had to stop at the Kagera River and they would trade with Buganda there. Bunyoro was able to get coastal goods here and there, but mostly through trade with Buganda, until the early 1860s when they encountered the Arab slavers from the north. Shane Doyle tells us that Bunyoro emerged as a powerful middleman in the commercial networks of the region. Despite this, Bunyoro found itself a target of Arab slave traders from the north. By the time King Kamrasi was in power in the 1850s, they were struggling with the threat and he had proved to be utterly useless. He wasn't even supposed to be the Omukama, which means king. He usurped the throne when he killed his brother Olimi V and was given the name Chebambe, which means usurper. This, of course, didn't go well with many people in the country. The princes in the north rose up in rebellion to challenge him. The institution of Nyiramwiru spoke out against him, and he doubled down in order to consolidate his power. You can see how this period was marked with so much social strife. There are so many elements here that it can be difficult to keep track of. So Kamarasi's brother Omdaya sided with him when he heard rumors that Kamarasi had been gravely injured in battle. This meant that he had no chance of keeping the throne because now he had to kill himself. But this was not true. The rebellious princes were spreading rumors as a way to get people on their side. The truth was that Kamarasi was only hurt in the finger. News reached Omadaya, and he mobilized his army in order to fight for his brother. The two sides clashed at the Battle of Kokoitwa, and it stands out because, one, Omadaya won the fight for his brother, but also because so many princes lost their lives. It's noted that Omadaya wasn't even happy after the win. 
He was so disheartened after what he had done that he even refused to speak to his brother. Kamarasi sent him a message congratulating him for his win, and his response was, open quotes, tell him not to congratulate me for destroying our family and clan. Close quotes. Omadaya also refused to sound his military drum on the march back, which was custom after victory. Two princes survived that battle, Ryonga and Mfuhuka, and these two would prove to be nasty thorns in Kamarasi's side for the entirety of his regime. It was also around this time that European explorers started coming into Bunyoro. The first were John Speak and James Grant in 1862. These two were there to find the source of the Nile. They traveled from Zanzibar to the kingdom of Karagwe, up north to Buganda, where King Mutesa made them wait for a long time before seeing them, which is one of the things that left them with a bad impression of him. Perhaps the king felt that you can't just show up to his court and expect to see him. But we'll talk about Mutesa when I cover Buganda next. From there, they traveled to Bunyoro, and Kamrasi did the exact same thing as Mutesa. He made them wait nine days before they could see him. This appeared rude to his guests, but Kamrasi had clear tactical reasons for taking his time. For starters, he wasn't sure that his guests were who they said they were. They came separately and from two different directions as if planning an attack. Secondly, the locals were scared of them, assuming that they were the Betrezi who had returned to take back their kingdom. And also, it was very possible that they could be in league with the Arab slave traders in the north. And that was something that very much troubled Kamarasi. Not to mention that Kamarasi didn't understand their intentions. Trade, he could understand. But finding the source of the Nile? What? Why? He apparently once asked the explorer Samuel Baker if he didn't have water where he came from. The idea of gaining prestige for finding a source of water was lost on him. It also didn't help that the Waganda were spreading rumors that Europeans were cannibals. Waganda took the opportunity to start trouble between Bunyoro and the Europeans. If they could discourage a good relationship between the two, this would make them the go-to people in the region, which meant a better trade relationship for them. In any case, Speaking Grand said that they were there to start a trade relationship between Bunyoro and Europe. He did let Speaking Grand travel down the Nile to the Karuma Falls, but would not let them go to Lake Mutanzige, which is known today as Lake Albert. Speak believed that Lake Albert was the source of the Nile. He was later proven correct by Samuel Baker and Henry Morton Stanley, but that it was the second source of the Nile, Lake Victoria being the major and first source. Anyways, these two left and journeyed north to Gondokoro in South Sudan. There, they met Samuel Baker. He was the explorer who Kamarasi later asks if he didn't have water where he came from. Baker took the advice of Speaking Grant and proceeded to Bunyoro. Now this is important, because Baker goes on to be a major character in late 19th century Bunyoro history. He enters what is today Uganda and reaches the Karuma Falls on the 22nd of January, 1864. And as Kamarasi had done before, he would not allow Baker to proceed any further. You see, at this point, Kamarasi was way more guarded than he had been when Speak and Grant had visited. But it changed. Here's what happened. During that time, some men of a notorious slaver named Debano had entered Bunyoro and claimed to be friends of Speak and Grant. How did they know of Speak and Grant? I'm so glad you asked, my dear valued listener. It turns out that when Speak and Grant went to South Sudan, they met these men and told them of a kingdom south called Bunyoro. This, of course, wasn't done with any malintent. They were merely talking about their travels. But the slavers heard little nuggets of gold. This meant that they had found a target for raids. So being the wonderful hosts that the Banyora are, they fed and housed these men because they said that they were friends of Speaking Grant. Only for them to turn on them, rob, and massacre their hosts. And here Baker was, arriving with these known slave traders in tow. You can understand Kamrasi's and the people's distrust. Not to mention, the local Banyoro believed that these fair-skinned people roaming the land might have been the Batrezi returning to take back their kingdom. Needless to say, it wasn't until February 10th, 1864 that Baker met Kamrasi. 
At which point he was too sick to even stand that they had to lay him before Kamarasi. Gifts were exchanged and Baker made his request. His goal was to find Lake Muitanzige, which is today known as Lake Albert. But the king had a request of his own. He wanted Baker to join him in his fight against his brother, Ruyonga. Some of you might ask why he would want the help of an explorer. But it's important to understand that Kamarasi realized what an alliance with Baker could do for him. He could get access to different weapons and also trade with a foreign power. But that's not what Baker was there for. He was there simply to explore. Baker recorded that Kamrasi was relentless in his request to ask him to join his fight. That and also literally asking him for his possessions, an act which he described as begging. The ethnographer John Beatty says that Kamrasi must have seen the Europeans as rich in unfamiliar objects and firearms and thus felt it was fine to ask. Which makes sense. I mean, wouldn't you? If you had never seen a pocket watch or any of our modern gadgets, would they not fascinate you? These things were foreign and represented an entire world out there that he had yet to explore. But I do understand Baker's irritation towards this. That being said, calling him a beggar, I find to be a bit harsh. Because it is worth noting that Kamrasi did give Baker so much ivory that he needed 700 porters to carry it when he was leaving. Whatever the case... This period in Bunyoro history is remembered differently by Bunyoro and Europeans based on the writings of Samuel Baker. These writings painted Bunyoro in such a negative light that later visitors came to the country believing them to be savages, lazy, and hostile to foreigners. So what on earth possessed Baker to write about them this way? Hmm. For one, Baker's personality was not suited to the job of diplomacy. Beatty describes him as a blunt and tactless man his saving grace being his wife, who at least understood the importance of diplomacy? To give you an example of Baker's behavior, Kamarasi once complained to Baker that one of his slave trader buddies had publicly insulted him and threatened him with a gun. Kamarasi told him that had he not been Baker's friend, he would have had him and his men killed right then and there. Baker turned to Kamarasi and told him that he shouldn't act so tough, because these slave traders could unite and destroy him easily along with his country. He later wrote that this made the gallant Kamrasi turn green. This is something that he said to a king. Out loud. None of his subjects ever spoke to him this way. So you can see how Baker handled the interactions with the king. Plus, his association with the Arab slave traders did not help matters at all. But still, Baker was allowed to find the secondary source of the Nile. But afterwards... Kamrasi was determined to convince him to join his fight against Ruyonga. So it's said that Kamrasi kept Baker in a state of semi-starvation by not sending supplies consistently. This was his attempt to break Samuel Baker. They survived on finger millet and spinach for two months before eventually giving in. Baker finally told the messenger that if Kamrasi wanted an alliance, he was going to have to come see him in person. The king wasted no time, and immediately they were given the proper supplies and taken to the king. And it was at this meeting that Samuel Baker learned a plot-twisting new piece of information. The man that he had come to know as Kamrasi was not Kamrasi, but rather his brother, Mgambi. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> He was so furious. He responded, The deceit in this country is incredible. Baker had this large, bushy beard, and because of this, the Manyoro called him Muleju, which literally means beard. And I imagine his beard was moving up and down while he was saying this. The deceit in this country is unbearable, or incredible. Saying it like the like the mayor of Townsville in Powerpuff Girls. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that cartoon. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a nerd. But Baker was furious at the turn of events. He was so mad that he refused to accept the fake Kamarasi's explanation that the king was afraid that he might have been in league with the slave trader Debano. The king didn't want to take any chances in case this was a ploy to kill him. Kamarasi also believed that if Baker had agreed to an alliance, this would prove that he was not with the slave traders. That did not matter to him, though. He was fully prepared to leave. But... 
after he was done sulking, he did end up meeting with the real Kamrasi and helped him stop an invasion of the slavers by putting up the Union Jack. The slave traders knew that the British were firmly against the slave trade. They had abolished slavery in 1833 and had set up a blockade to stop slave ships in the Atlantic. A Union Jack in Bunyoro meant that they were protected by the British. In a nutshell, the relationship between Baker and Kamrasi was frustrated by a lack of trust and respect. Kamrasi never really got over his suspicions of Baker. And on the other hand, Baker saw Kamrasi as a rude, cowardly, and covetous man, unworthy of his respect. The historian Jihumru Apuli mentions that Baker was used to dealing with the minor headmen of the sequentary Nilotic tribes of the north. So when he came across Kamrasi, a king of an autocratic society with a long, prestigious history, he found it difficult to deal with him. One more thing I'd like to add that I found amusing in regards to this whole Kamrasi-Baker affair. There was an incident where Baker accidentally spilled ashes from his smoking pipe onto the head of one of Kamrasi's sons. The people in the room all gasped, much to Baker's confusion. Kamrasi and every Munyoro in that room saw it as an attempt by Baker to bewitch his son. This, of course, wasn't the case. It might have been an accident, but who knows? But through the Munyoro's worldview? To them, it seemed like witchcraft. It seemed like the white man's witchcraft. So it's another example of one of the things that caused tension between these two men. Anyways, Baker left the country in 1864, and Kamrasi later died in 1869. His death couldn't have come sooner for a lot of people in Munyoro. Historian Nsamba says that the people never liked Kamrasi. He usurped the throne and caused the devastation that followed. The war between him and his brother had raged on for years. What's more, people lived in constant fear of being enslaved, and these slavers were now fighting with Ryonga in order to install him as king. Ryonga was no doubt desperate to seek their help because there's no way he didn't know about their brutal tactics. The Arab slave traders had a tendency to side with one group over another until they won, then turned on their allies and enslaved them too. It's said that when Kamrasi fell ill, few were willing to help him. Fisher wrote that the people said, Let the old man die. He who has cursed others with sickness is now himself cursed. He who wished the death of his blood brother, let him die first. Kamrasi was at the time the latest example of the crop of leaders that the once great kingdom of Nora was subjected to. But that all changed with the next monarch. You see, it isn't true that Nora was in a constant state of decline all the way into colonization. Contrary to popular belief, Winyoro was able to transform itself into one of East Africa's most innovative and commercially oriented societies. And this was all thanks to one man. He is known as Rotamahanga, the consumer of rebellious nations, and also the defiant. His name? Kabalega. Thank you for listening, and tune in next time to the Those Who Came Before Us podcast.